Hello and welcome to the AB Forums podcast for Monday the 3rd of July and joining me on this edition are assistant editor Steve Withers. I trust my barber. News editor Mark Hodgkinson. Sorry I'm late, work was murder. Audio reviewer Ed Selly. Yeah I hate the little things. And special guest star Mark Botwright. Why do we need to talk now? We're back yet again for another podcast. It is July, isn't this year just flying back? Chris, CES feels like a few weeks ago. It's strange how the year is just flying in and, and the weeks just tumble on by and yeah, anybody else feeling old at this point? Yes, I mean, I mean, as I was saying before we started recording, I managed to do my back in, and what you're saying there, it's just like the bloody lyrics to bloody Pink Floyd's "Time," isn't it? You run, <laughs> I'm joining you run the to catch up with the sun, but it's sinking. I'm joining the Geriatrics Club. I've also got an extremely bad back, and it's been plaguing me all week. So, so welcome to the AV <laughs> Forums Podcast Bad Back Edition. Yeah, well, and I am very coat, sore coat fingers. Coat because the TV just collapsed on them, so that that's quite painful. Uh, that was... Next next week we can review painkillers and strollers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if it's motorised scooters, I'm there. Oh, I tell you what, I'm not far well, off it. Well, they call little, little rascals. <laughs> <laughs> and we could have we could have some drag races down at Santa Pod with the with the scooters. We could hire some at CES and race around yeah. the uh, show floor on them. <laughs> That would be a good video. I'd next, definitely watch that. Next year at Vegas, you're hitting the strip in your mobility scooters. Yep, that's it. <laughs> they see me rolling, they hate me. And we, we, we've all got a, we are just one piece jumpsuits as well. So the one piece suits with the, with the, you know, mobility scooters, uh, bibs and the burger bags in the front of the carrying thing. There you go. Sorry. I think we've got them anyway. Class. Yeah. So talking about videos, uh, AV Forum's YouTube channel, just a quick uh, report on that. We've uh, just passed 30 million views. That means that our videos have been viewed 30 million times, probably by Steve, who loves himself, and just uh, hit and repeat <laughs> on them. Uh, but 30 million no. views. Uh, we are just approaching 50,000 subscribers as well. If you're not a subscriber of the channel, why not? It's informative. It's entertaining. Uh, or, or, or as somebody put it in the thread, occasionally entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> it's free. Yeah. I'm good. I'm good with that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah best of all, it's free. <laughs> yeah, it is free. It's free to use. Free at the point of use, you know. We've usually got some decent stuff on there, like reviews of the latest TVs, uh, TV settings, um, what's the correct way of setting things up, and we've got loads of plans uh, going forward on what we're going to do with the channel, um, lots of ideas for new videos and so on. So if you're not a subscriber, then head to uh, youtube.com forward slash AV forums, and uh, why not get yourself subscribed up and start watching some of our videos because like somebody said occasionally they're entertaining <laughs> i'll tell you what was know. scary it was reading mark's uh, piece of edit on the front page obviously he linked to a few uh, of the popular videos most popular videos and uh, i think the most popular i pulled in six hundred thousand views and there was a tv review that i did it had half a million views and it suddenly dawned on me that literally millions of people have seen my front room which is well, at least one half of my phone. Yeah, <laughs> it's slightly dis- <laughs> um, uh, unnerving. <laughs> uh, what was surprising for me was the first video back in two thousand and eight um, was Valencia, uh, the Panasonic, the first sort of big Panasonic convention, and we've been everyone since then and produced yeah. videos from everyone since then. And uh, uh, I remember it, it wasn't called the European Convention back then, though, was it? That it first was, event, it was called the networking H- event, HD networking, something or other. But it, it morphed into the convention. I think yeah. the next again year it was called the convention it used to tour around and it used to be some really some really interesting places around europe uh, nowadays it's it's focused on germany because the head office is there but uh, yeah it was stuff like that um hdr we, i was yeah, talking to amazing stephen amazing. stephen old back at the bristol show back in uh, you know 2008 it was a sim 2 tv which never saw the light of day unfortunately and excuse the pun but it was a it was a, a backlit fully full array backlit sim 2 prototype tv showing dolby what they called dolby contrast at the time which then became dolby vision or it was dolby contrast and dolby vision at yeah, the time was both, yeah the dolby contrast was i think because i was watching it thinking why are they talking about local dimming that's not exactly new and i realized well, well, that back it was, in 2008, it, was <laughs> it was it was groundbreaking back yeah, then <laughs> yeah and it just shows you how how long it takes for some of these things so that's nearly 10 years for it to become full circle again and, and back in the public conscious and 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 actually available Available now on TVs. It's taken that length of time to get round to that. So, uh, so yeah, it's been interesting looking through some of the old videos. Uh, the the bloopers reel always has me laughing. It's it's the ones where I'm at one side of the 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 stand, you're at the other side, and I'm trying to direct you from over there, and you're. <laughs> 
can't hear you. I'm you kind of hear what's going on in backwards. Of, oh, I'm always in stitches at that bit. Always. Is that the one where the bloke stops and just stares at me, and then one yep. guy takes a picture of me? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to see some of the older videos, uh, the story is on the homepage. Go and have a look at that, and um, have a look at some of the videos. And if you're not a subscriber, subscribe up. Right, let's move on. Do we have any competitions, Mr. Hodge? Yeah, we've got a copy of L on Blu-ray, and the uh, competition closes on the 6th of July. And you can also win a copy of Pilgrimage on Blu-ray, and that one closes on the 7th of July. Uh, any previous competition winners? Not yet. We're still waiting for the Scan Action Cam winner. This time next week, we'll know. Okay, cool. And uh, obviously, uh, if you're listening to this on the Monday, tomorrow is the 4th of July. Uh, so who's watching Independence Day? Um, mm. I don't, well, I didn't have it planned. I suppose I could. No, I don't know. Probably not. In Sorry, a world of America. Donald Trump, it seems strangely optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> In the event of an alien invasion now, we're going to discover that Trump is actually an alien. He was the advanced party, wasn't he? <laughs> Sent to soften us up. <laughs> His face reminds me of, you know that scene in Total Recall where Arnold Schwarzenegger's got the woman's head on? Yeah. And it starts malfunctioning. <laughs> so, is it David Icke who's convinced that all leaders are um, actually alien lizards in disguise? He still is entirely convinced on that. It's great because... Hey, I'm beginning twi- to think he might have a point, by the way. <laughs> his Twitter is it's sort of entirely lucid and then lizard people. It's brilliant. Um, you know, well worth a it's follow. Like, it's like a documentary, isn't it, where it's like, yeah, I'm not saying it was aliens. But it was aliens. <laughs> or lizards in, in Ike's case. Or alien lizards. Well, I'll be spending the 4th of July in a car park. With, uh... more, more dogging for you then? Dogging you, okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, it just, just so happens it's the, it's the Northern Pony Club that night. So, um, it's that, a good name I'm for sure. an album. If, no one's no, if, any, if any band is listening, I, I would wholeheartedly recommend the idea of Northern Pony Club. I think well, that's a cracker. Uh, we've got Tuesday the Northern Pony Club and then Wednesday it's American Muscle which always sounds a bit weird. <laughs> that always sounds well dodgy. <laughs> right, let's move on. Uh, let's go to some hardware stuff, and let's go to Mr. Potwright. We haven't heard his dulcet tones on the, the podcast for a while, so uh, SNES Classic Edition, is it coming? Yes, yes, I'm sure this is the news you were all waiting for. Um, <laughs> we we had last, <laughs> last November the NES Classic Edition, um, kind of dubbed the NES Mini due to its diminutive size, Um perfect little scale replica that emulated old NES cart titles which had 30 games built in for £50 which represented kind of good value um, in comparison particularly to how much the individual titles would cost via Nintendo's virtual console Um, and yeah this September 29th they've announced we will get the Super NES edition Um, £69.99 slight bump in price Um, same deal though kind of a micro console scale replica Um, and it, it's it's got a, a couple of nice little details in there um, rather than have just the kind of generic um, Wii style pad port. They've got a little the front of the console actually looks like the original SNES, which then flips down. And then you can plug in the, the pads. Um, I'm sure that's a detail you're you're interested in. Um, otherwise, same same deal. HDMI uh, out um, USB powered. No AC adapter in the box, though, again. Um, like in the 90s, we get the better looking console in, in Europe uh, rather than the kind of ugly US version, which was like a, a kind of square brick with purple bits on it. Um, only 21 games this time, but it, it's very much a case of uh, kind of best of um, Super Metroid, F-Zero, Super Mario Kart, Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Um, and the kind of big news, the big kind of selling point for anyone who was potentially on kind of on the fence about it is you'll get Star Fox 2, which was an unreleased sequel to Star Fox, the kind of revolutionary space shooter that used the Super FX chip. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of its big selling point. And also, it should be noted, um, that slight bump in price, you will get two pads in the box, which, considering you've got Mario Kart in there and you've got Street Fighter 2 Turbo, I think they've done that particularly because last year, the pads, the extra pads for the NES Mini, um, were kind of taken over by scalpers and they became you know cost as much as the console in some places uh, straight away um it became extremely hard to get hold of so two pads in the box fewer games but they've kept the quality up and yeah seems seems perfect for a little nostalgia trip well, you've ordered one of course, of course i ordered, ordered one, one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I spent that evening hitting f5 and constantly each site it, it was each site crashed as soon as they put up pre-orders. They were up for, you know, kind of 10 minutes on each site. And I went through each one and just 
constant constant agony um you know because you you spend all the time kind of cursing everyone else oh who are all these idiots all these nerds who are crashing this site then you realize it's you you know you keep just hitting back an f5 um but yeah i've managed managed to get my pre-order in so fingers crossed how much is it 69.99 no that's not too expensive that's not bad for a nice nostalgia trip is it really no it I was thinking about this when when the news came out. Uh, um, I realised to my astonishment in my thirty six years, I have never played on a SNES. I've used a NES and I used N sixty four. Never used a SNES at no stage in my entire existence. How bizarre is that? I, I can safely see I, I've never. Oh my word! You're all Two missing out. I have one. Oh. <laughs> I don't I, know. I, I I think at the time I was a, I was I had a Sega Mega Drive. I think. Oh dear! I had an Amiga. I, I, had, I had nothing because I was an adult. <laughs> <laughs> Boo! But yeah. Um, well, as I say, I, I, I'm assuming they're probably all sold by now. But well, uh, keep, keep your eye open because a few businesses, you know, uh, like Argus opened up their pre-orders again um, late towards when the NES Classic um, launched, and I'd completely missed out the pre-orders for that early on, and I think I managed to get one kind of within about you know, a month or two of launch. Luckily, there will still be a few places left around. Um, but I, I definitely say, if you're interested, grab one, because the, the NES version was very kind of scarce. It ended up selling 2.3 million units, which, you know, if you consider what the Wii U sold, that's about kind of 12, 13 million, just in a short space of time, you know, kind of six, nine months. Which that, does that, beg the question, I mean, I understand the rules of scarcity and so on and so forth, but would strike me as logical to have made more of them unless they weren't making any money on them, which is obviously quite a Nintendo thing to do. Well, I, I think, I mean, initially everyone kind of assumed, well, this is a, a fantastic idea. This will be an ongoing thing and they'll continue printing money for it. But however, it seems more like it was designed for a limited run anyway um, to kind of create that buzz around Nintendo's back catalogue because they're going to unroll uh, unfold this year the kind of uh, their online version of like PlayStation Plus or Games with Gold, their version of that kind of service for the Switch, which will involve some kind of either the rental or you will have the title forever as long as you stay subscribed to their, you know, online service. So that will have kind of older titles. And so it, it kind of becomes quite a hard value proposition to push towards people, particularly if they're not that interested in, say, multiplayer titles, if you can see all of those games available for a decent price with this nice little replica console as well. You know, I think it's more just to kind of create that buzz to remind people Mm. that these were good games and they still do hold up quite well. Because ultimately, I mean, most people who are interested in this kind of tech, you could, you know, grey area perhaps, but you can put them all on an emulator, you can pop them on your phone, you can, you know, add a kind of pair of pad to it. There are various different ways that people can do it. I mean, it will all run on your on your, you know, on your PC, on your laptop, on on your tablet. So, you know, it's it's kind of a novelty factor. However, it's still the fact that they are seemingly the best versions of these titles emulated because even on the NES Mini, they were better than the ones that had appeared on Nintendo's own consoles, on the Wii and on the Wii U you know had better colors and you know you're going to be getting you know 60 hertz versions of these ones so if you were a uk gamer and there are titles that you were annoyed about that had kind of power slowdown you're getting that kind of better version of the title but yeah i I think it was very much designed to be a limited thing just create that buzz and then when people can't get hold of it and they say well i'll just you know i'll download that title on my switch for you know a few pounds at a time yeah i suppose that makes sense um, there was a cracking tweet from uh, a guy who was, I can't remember, like saying, he, he was retweeted into my timeline. He was a games journalist at the time when the SNES was, was live. And he goes, a whole new generation of people are going to discover just how unkind and unforgiving 90s computer games actually were. And I, I, when you actually think back to it, you know, fix save points, if there were save points and all sorts of other other brutality uh yeah that, 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 it's gonna gonna be interesting to see how, how how a number of people get on with that well i'll be totally honest i wouldn't have pre-ordered if it didn't have the fact that you can save at any stage this is that's oh. what what pushed me over the edge with the with the mm. nez version as well <laughs> is i no i couldn't go in for that idea of sitting down and saying right i've got to play through the, the entire game that's why and, some of know, us are no longer gamers 
exactly. Well, this you get four save states for each title. So therefore, if you want to kind of dub save scum it and just go a little bit further each time and then save your progress, uh, you can do so. So, you know, fill your boots and cheat if you want. Okay, so that's the SNES Classic Edition. It's uh, it's on. The or way. drink four liters of Coke and do it old school. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's move on. Talking about cool car, but Steve's uh, next. So uh, Panasonic UB three hundred and UB four hundred Ultra HD Blu Ray players. I feel for you having to re- review these together because not a lot of difference there. No, it's always tricky, isn't it, when you've got two products that are pretty much exactly the same, apart from a few cosmetic differences, and you have to write two completely different reviews, and, and you, you don't want to repeat yourself, but at the same time, you are talking about the same things. Um, Panasonic have publicly said, and we, you were with me, Phil, we were talking to their engineers when we were at their convention back in um, back in February when they actually announced the UB300 and 400. They said that, you know, despite the difference in prices, despite the difference in appearance, perhaps, all those players, from the 900 down to the 300, use the same chipset and the same processing inside. So you get the same picture. You might not get the same features in, in some respects, but you do get the same picture. So, and I have checked this, you know, obviously I've double checked this. I've had all four players in now. Uh, I've used the same test discs, the same uh, calibrated images, uh, same setup, gone through the, all the menus are identical, of course, everything's exactly the same. And I can vouch for the fact that these do output over digital exactly the same image. Um, and you think about it, logically, they have to, don't they really? And they're reading a, a number of, uh, reading basically ones and zeros off of a disc and they're outputting those ones and zeros down the HDMI cable to the display. There's no real way they can be different unless they're there's... doing something they shouldn't be doing to the image. Yeah. yeah, Unless there's some backdoor processing going on that we don't know about, which has happened on some players. I'm sure Mark can vouch for this too. Certainly on earlier Samsung players, there was a bit of backdoor noise reduction going on. So that kind of thing would affect it, but that's a player doing something to the signal that it necessarily shouldn't be doing. But with these players, they're all outputting exactly the same thing. So even if you buy the UB300, which is a cracking uh for the money, absolutely cracking player. Yes, it's got its supports. It's only got one HDMI output. So if you have a, a soundbar or receiver that doesn't support HDCP 2.2 and HDR and 4K, then it really isn't the player for you because you can't you can't run it. It doesn't even have a um, optical digital output either. So really, you can only buy this player if you've got fully spec'd up you know, display, obviously, and also receiver or soundbar that can pass everything through. So bear that in mind. It doesn't have built-in Wi-Fi either. So you're going to have to use a wired connection if you want to use the, uh, you know, the streaming service and that sort of stuff. But is a hundred? You can get it on Amazon for 188 quid. Well, uh, which... that that kind of you know psychological price point um, of 200 pounds, it's below that. So that's what's going to attract people. But actually, when you look at it, I think it's 30 or 40 quid extra gets you the Wi-Fi, it gets you an extra HDMI output, um, and and it gets you the UB400. So. Unless, like you say, you, you, you can take advantage of it. Obviously, the sweet spot is going to be the 400. Yeah, I mean, if you, assuming you need those other features or want them, then yes, the 400 is only going to be, you, know, you get it for 240 quid. Um, so it's not a lot more, but you do get very useful things like built-in Wi-Fi, which I think most people come to expect these days. You get a slightly better build quality with a drop-down flap. Basically, it looks like a smaller version of the 700 now. Um, and in fact, it does make the 700 kind of redundant because it's got, the same outputs at the rear. It's obviously the same processing and image quality. It's got all the same features. In fact, there is no difference between the uh, between the four hundred and the three. Sorry, the four hundred and the seven hundred. Except that the four hundred has an additional USB port, uh, a three point zero port, which is handy. It also has a slightly redesigned remote control, as does the three hundred, which now has um, the picture info button that I really liked on the controller for the nine hundred. That's now on the controller. So I, I, it sounds I, like you know, for those owners of the seven hundred try and get yourself a, a remote that has that because it's such a useful feature you can access it via the options button but it's but having that button just to press is brilliant because you see exactly what the disc is encoded that and exactly what the player's outputting and that can be really useful particularly when you're like testing tvs and stuff to see what the tv is telling the player or what the player thinks the tv is doing it's, it can be a really useful feature so that can be accessed directly now on the, on the remote control there's also a button now on the remote control to directly access the hdr settings and that's some of the so what's so interesting about the two new players is they have, a, um, as I say, a slightly revised remote control compared to the 700, and they also have a, a new feature <laughs> that isn't available on um, on the 900 or 700, although it's a feature I don't think you're ever going to, I can't imagine you're going to need it, but it, they do actually convert HLG, hybrid log gamma, into HDR10 um, if your TV didn't support hybrid log gamma, although I'm not entirely sure where the player will be getting HLG from it. Maybe player. it's the B- yeah. it could be the BBC, BBC, yeah, I player. the BBC I player. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So 
that that's where that feature might come in handy. Well, that, that's you know, that's what the that's what right. the engineer said at the convention anyway. Was yeah. BBC iPlayer is likely to go HLG at some point. So if you're watching yeah, it that, through that that player, then you know it, at least it's gonna it's gonna output the HDR. It'll just be doing it as HDR10 and not HLG. Yeah, Evil TV. I mean, you can you can output HLG. Evil TV doesn't support does support HLG, but if it doesn't, then it has this additional feature. So it might come in handy in the future. Yep. Cool. Uh, also new. New, but uh, this applies to all the players now because it's, it's been a firmware update for the 700 and 900. Another new feature is they call it a dynamic adjust, dynamic range adjust, uh, which is actually quite a use, quite a handy feature because obviously a lot of people have complained that, particularly with darker films, sometimes watching H- HDR in a brightly lit room, it doesn't look as, as impressive and, and, and something's going to look a bit dark. This feature will allow you to sort of lighten the image. Um, overall image a bit, but it does it in quite a sophisticated way. It's not it's not a linear approach. It's a non-linear approach in terms of how it does it. Um, so it can be quite useful for that if you're watching HDR in a very bright lit room or during you the have day, a projector. for example, or you have a projector, and it can be dead handy for that too. Um, so that's a nice little feature that's on all the players now, all all of Panasonic's players. It's worth checking out. Steve, I read um, a, I read a review that said that the the 900 had better picture quality than the 700. Yeah, it's cobblers. <laughs> Absolutely cobblers. They're, they're identical players. I mean, yes, one's THX certified, the other one isn't. But th- th- in terms of the actual processing and the chipset and the menu system and the setup and the features, all exactly the same. All exactly the same. And the same goes for the 400 and 300, by the way, as I said. Yeah. People can't set them up wrong, I guess. Maybe they've set it up wrong. They could be set up. Well, I'm thinking about this. Though. You're setting up differently or you're using a different TV or the TV's not set up yeah. correctly. What I'm saying is I've tested them, set up exactly the same with the same content on calibrated televisions. Uh, exactly the same in terms of their of their performance. So, you know, uh, yeah, there's no difference. There's no difference at all. And uh, I think uh, I think we've said this many times in reviews, haven't we, Mark and, and you, Phil, with these players. You know, as long as the player is not doing something behind the scenes is not meant to be doing, any Blu-ray player or Ultra HD Blu-ray player should output exactly the same um, exactly the same image. Yeah. Um, where it can add value, I guess, is you could say when well, you're talking about playing a Blu-ray, then obviously that is being uh, you can upscale it. So there can be some upscaling involved for a Blu-ray to output it 4K to your display. So there's a possibility that the processing could be different from not the same manufacturer, because like I say, with Panasonic, it's all the same processing. But obviously, say we're comparing as Panasonic to, I don't know, a Samsung, for example. Uh, also, if you're playing a DVD, then you've got deinterlacing and scaling to that. So there's um, there are areas where there could be differences in that sense. But in terms of actually just outputting a UHD Blu-ray to a UHD TV, there should be no difference. Okay, let's move things along. So uh, we were just talking about projectors. 4K is starting to appear in projectors, but this idea of native 4K, there's still only Sony in the market who do native 4K. And um, I have the new Acer V9800 in for review at the minute. It's a DLP projector. I have seen other reviewers and journalists out there say that this is a native 4K projector. It is nothing of the sort. It's using the new uh, Texas Instruments DLP chip, which is a 0.66 inch 4K. Well, they call it 4K UHD chip, but actually what it's doing (laughs) is basically pixel shift, Steve. Um, We had this conversation with a Vivitech rep uh, at CES as well. He was banging on about it being a 4K projector and so on. Technically, it's not. Um, Technically, what the chip has four four million mirrors. Four million million. mirrors, and what it does is it it flashes twice, which gives you eight million pixels, uh, a four K image. So, and it flashes twice, and when it's flashing twice, what it's doing is it's pixel shifting. So, it'll flash one pixel, and then it'll flash the pixel. Now, I'm not sure whether it's horizontally or, or. diagonally i suspect it will be diagonally there is a video on the ti website if you want to go and get all the details on that it's only a three minute long video but it explains what the technology is actually doing so to put put this to bed straight away before we start talking about this uh, it's not a native 4k projector the chip is a four point something million mirrors and it produces eight point something million pixels on the screen but it is a pixel shift however um because it's 0.66 inches it fits in a consumer display and it is cheaper to manufacture than the, I think it's a 1.6 inch digital cinema chip in the big projectors. That's the native 4K one, isn't it? This, which is a native 4K. So, you know, it's it's reduced the size of the chip, they can fit in a consumer display and it's cheaper for them to make, which means that we will get cheaper displays, which we're all for because, you know, Epson do it, JVC do it, 
And really, when you've got a native projector next to them, it's other picture attributes r other than the resolution uh, that draws your eye to the image. What I will say about, obviously, DLP technology is it's razor sharp. You know, you get the focus bang on, it is razor sharp compared to Leica's projectors or, you know, LCD projectors like the, like the Epson's. So, yeah, it's an interesting technology. This is the first DLP that we've had in for review uh, that claims to be 4K. Like I say, it comes from Acer. It's £4,000, which is not, you know, mega Ooh, expensive. It's not mega expensive, but it's a bit toppy when you start looking at the likes of Epson and JVCs. And an, an Optomer, isn't it? It's more than and, Optoma, I, uh, I don't know what the Optoma price is at the minute, but um, yeah, it's it's coming into a crowded marketplace, and the problems kind of start from there because um, it is a very DLP image. So there's some real pros when it comes to DLP. Motion being one of them, um, you know, brilliant motion on there. Sadly, no 3D on this. <laughs> DLP is usually bang on for 3D, but there is no 3D compatibility on this projector. And then you start looking at the downsides. So black levels, they're they're no better on here than they are on the top of the range BenQ projectors. Um, so black levels are not great. ANSI contrast is reasonable, but still, if you get a mixed scene that's that's taking place in a in a tunnel or something like that, and you've got a little bit of light and and you're really counting on shadow detail to make the image pop, it's not there. So compared to the competition from Epson and, and from JVC, even from the cheaper Sony all manual um, projectors like the HW range, it's seriously lacking, which is a shame because color wise, um, it's it's really quite good. It's Rec seven hundred nine native and you know, it's 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 good. It produces a, a nice cinematic looking image, which is really sharp. Big plus point of DLP is the sharpness. It's just the black levels let it down. There's greyness there. And the other thing, at four thousand pounds, it's an all manual projector. So it's a manual operation when it comes to focus, it's a manual operation when it comes to zoom, and it does have lens shift, which is a big plus point for a DLP because most DLPs are the fixed. The rarity, isn't it? Yeah, mm. the, most DLPs these days are fixed. Um, so this does have you know horizontal and, and vertical shift, uh, which does help with the installation. It's a big unit as well. It's the same size as my X7000 uh, JVC. Um, so, so it is a big chassis. Two, 240 watt lamp output. So uh, it's boasting 2200 lumens um it's not obviously that's in the brightest possible mode when you get into an accurate looking mode uh, you're around about the the 900 lumen mark um that's on a 110 inch screen and yeah i mean it's 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 an adequate but it's just overpriced projector and you know you can't take advantage of any of the motorized zoom features and that kind of thing because it doesn't have it so if you've got a 235 screen you're better suited with the Epson or the JVC, which has the lens shift memories, which is a must for me these days. Although I, you know, I do realise that a lot of people like to like to have a, a large 169 screen and then you know watch different material uh, at different aspect ratios. But I like to go wider for for cinema scopes. I like the 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 memory zoom and stuff, and it's just not there. So again, this is features that the Epson and the JVC have. And the the main thing for me is the ab absolute image quality. It's for four thousand pounds, it's not there. It's a nice image, it's a bright image. It would suit, not a bat cave, it would suit uh, a normal living room where you have light coloured walls and a light ceiling, light coloured ceiling, because um, you, you're raising the black floor of the room, so black levels wouldn't be as much of an issue in a room like that, and the extra brightness would help. Colours are fantastic, it's got really, really nice colours for, for a DLP. Another thing I did notice though was rainbow effect. Normally I'm not too bad with it. I, I, usually I have to move my head or, you know, provoke it to see it with the, the likes of BenQ projectors and that kind of thing I, uh, nowadays you know the color wheel is that fast and, and and that stable that you have to provoke it with with this uh, the 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 Acer I saw it a lot more and I don't know if that's maybe because the chip is is flashing as well and that's introducing it back into the because you've got the color wheel turning it's an RGB RGB color wheel and you've also got the the chip doing the pixel shift really really quickly so maybe that is is an issue and maybe that's why I'm seeing more rainbow effect than I normally would and it's it's not overkill it's not all the time it's just on, on high contrast scenes uh, or black and white scenes so for example I was running one of the DTS demo discs on loop just to warm it up um, the other day before I went in to, to do some testing on it and it has clips that are in black and white of people making noises 
if you're familiar with the demo disc. Um, so those are <laughs> those are shot in black and white sequences. So every now and again, I was getting a film sequence and then these black and white sequences. And during the black and white sequences, or really high contrast, so I'm talking about um, really strong lighting on somebody's face or something like that, I really noticed the the rainbow effect. So again, if you're interested in this type type of projector or, or the Acer, I would get demoed before dropping four thousand pounds and to be honest i wouldn't be dropping four thousand pounds on it i think it's overpriced it's great to see it it's great to see uh, this chip finally coming to the market there's going to be more models coming from other manufacturers so acer are first out the door certainly in terms of getting the review samples to us benq have one in fact i think benq have two coming so one is rex 709 and the other does hdr um the only thing i haven't tested on this projector yet is hdr um i haven't had the opportunity it to does do that it, does it? It's, it has an HDR mode but um, the, I asked the question of the engineers and it came back and they said it's REC 709 but REC 2020 compatible so they didn't answer the question basically so I am assuming that it's just <laughs> it's just REC 709 it'll take an HDR signal but I think that, that again this is part of the test and I haven't done yet the projector only turned up um, end of last week so I've kind of been fighting to, to try and spend some time with it I'm going to spend some time with it over the weekend because obviously we've got really crap weather at the minute had it been two weeks ago when it was really hot <laughs> I would it hate to got looking, would it? <laughs> I, I wouldn't have been sitting in that cinema room during the day with, with, with it pumping heat into the room but because we're back to winter again now and it's been quite cool up here it's actually been quite pleasant going into the cinema room which is <laughs> You having heat pumped into it from this projector, so um, so yeah, I'm uh, I intend to spend some time over the weekend, this weekend coming. The review will be up as you listen to this podcast next week, um, because I'm going to spend some time really testing the the HDR side because that is the weak point at the minute with all of these projectors at the minute is HDR. Unless you're spending thirty odd thousand pounds on the JVC Z1, which you've had back in for review, Steve. Um, yes. And it's had the firmware update, which has has made some differences to the image quality. So, so jumping from the from the Acer, which it's not a badge winner, unfortunately, because it's just overpriced. You know, four thousand pounds is just too much. If it had been two thousand, then it's it's hitting its competition because it's up against the HW projectors from Sony and so on at, at that price point. If four thousand pounds, it's up against the JVC um, X uh, five thousand five hundred and the X seven thousand five hundred, which are the same as the X five thousand, the X seven thousand. They just they've just got an HDR thing in the menus now, so they're the same projector. Um, so it's up against that, and it's up against, like I say, the Epson, the TWs, and the TWs are fantastic value for money. Um, so. It, Unfortunately, it's just it's really, really strong competition for this this DLP projector, and it's the first one we've had in. I've got a funny feeling that most of these first generation models are going to be around about the four thousand price price tag, which is just you know when you look at the competition, and there's not a lot that ASA can do about the competition, and I guess there's not a lot they can do about the cost because it obviously costs them a certain amount of money to to bring this tech to to market. So anyway, that's that. So let's move on. Do you think, on to this. Though, do you think the, uh, the the 4K chip, the TI chip? has potential though in a better definitely um because like i was saying i mean i think you know um although i haven't got a native project 4k sony here at the moment i did have that when i had the epson and when i had the uh the jvc's in well obviously i've got a jvc x7000 so the jvc's always there um and when i've put native against you know these pixel shifting technologies whether it be epson's or whether it be jvc's um from a from a normal seating distance it's really really difficult when it comes to resolution, to to notice any real difference in terms of the native against these pixel shift technologies, and and it'll be the same with the DLP. And obviously, the DLP, one of the advantages is how sharp the image is with the DLP. You know, it's sometimes it's yeah. it's it's a bit too sharp to be cinematic. Sometimes it goes against <laughs> it. Sometimes it does go against it, and you have to. It starts to look a bit digital, a bit. A bit it, it does. It, I guess that's 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 one way you could describe it. Although it's not technically correct, but. Personally, I would slightly defocus um, because I think it's just too sharp. Which, which is fine if you're watching, you know, HD broadcast video or 4K broadcast video, which you know is inherently sharp as it is. But but film has that certain aesthetic look to it, which you know DLP it, it is it's sharp. Whether you like that or not, it, it's going to come down to a personal thing. There's there's that other features in there which I'll go into in, in detail within the review, such as super resolution and all that kind of thing, which a lot of the projectors have now. Um, it's kind of like the Dar- Darby effect. Um, a lot of these manufacturers are now adding their own image enhancement stuff, which is which is in there as well. So, but anyway, 
it, I guess what we're saying is it's overpriced for what it is, but it's great to see that technology come into market with the Texas Instruments um, uh, chip because it's, you know, it it's making it re- within reach now, 4K. And Pixel Shift 4K, like it, like done with, with this chip, it's more than adequate. Um, and uh, normal seating distance, I doubt you'll notice any difference between this and a native 4K yeah. projector. Uh, you know, my advice to people at the minute is don't be put off with it. If, you know, if you can afford an Epson or a JVC at the minute that that, that has the pixel shift, uh, whether it's the shift or or Epson's version, go buy one. You know, if you can afford yeah. one at the minute and you've got the the room to put it in and a nice a nice screen um, to use with it as well, it's stonking value at the minute. It really is. So um, yeah. So anyway, let's move on to the Z1 uh, very quickly. So you've retested it. What was the what was the outcome of that? Yeah, well, because when I did the original review, um, whilst it is a a superb projector in so many aspects, the one area that disappointed, and this is surprising for a JVC, is that the black levels were, were, well, to put it mildly mediocre, weren't they, Phil? Um, Not much better than a a DLP projector, and and which you were just criticising it for a minute ago. Uh, And that was disappointing. Um, But as it happens, there was a firmware update, which was applied just after I had the projector in for review, which seems a bit silly. You thought they might have waited. But um, so we arranged for it to come back with the new firmware. And yes, there has been an improvement. It it isn't. It still does not look as good in terms of contrast performance to I'd say it's well, it's certainly as good as the 5000, but not as good as the more expensive 7,000, 7,500, or 9,900, 5,000. It's, it's, um, it's definitely been improved, but it's still, I mean, I think they're going to struggle to make it approach anything like the contrast performance we expect from a JVC because this is so much brighter than any other projector they've ever made. Um, but it is definitely an improvement. And I think uh, it certainly made me more amenable to, amenable towards the projector in terms of its performance because it, did, it was better with uh, SDR content now and it still is, by my by my reckoning, by miles the best looking projected HDR image I've seen from anything, um, from any projector. So uh, it's it's absolutely cracking for HDR. Uh, it's the only projector I think that can deliver a genuinely HDR kind of performance that, um, on a projected image because you just can't get it from anything so else. How does that work then, Steve? Because you're saying the contrast performance isn't as great as the seven thousand, or it's on par with the seven and nine thousand, which. Are not that great with HDR. So, what? Where's the big difference coming from with with uh, with the Z1 and this new firmware? Then, I guess it's probably got more to do with how they're applying the, the laser light than um, because you're right. The, the the black floor is not as low um, as the seven thousand, nine thousand, and obviously when you go into HDR, that black floor rises even higher. But with the problem with the with the other projectors, because they're not that bright. To start with, that black floor becomes all the more obvious, and you end up with an image that hasn't got any decent blacks, but also hasn't got any brightness to it. Here, they've managed to implement. Uh, okay, the black floor still risen, so it's still not as low as we'd like. But because they've got so much more brightness, they can add. They, they've widened the range at the higher end to give it more impact. So it's not. Uh, it's not as limited in terms of. So, for example, with a film like um, Underworld, uh, Blood Wars, which is pretty much entirely takes place at night. Uh, watching that on an HDR projector normally is an unwatchable experience unless you start manipulating the image some way like we talk about with the players because it's just, they obviously, it's been um, graded for, I think it's 4,000 nits peak brightness, uh, but most of the image is nothing like that. So we end up with an image that's really uh, dark and, and dingy and difficult to see what's going on on object image. That was not the case with the, uh, with the, um, the uh, Z1. So clearly, the increased brightness and the way that they're tone mapping that content on that projector means that you get a, a better overall experience in terms of uh, projected image with HDR. But when it comes to SDR content, I still think that the, uh, the 7000 and the 9000 has the edge because it still has a decent black floor in SDR. Okay. So, does that, uh, answer, does that answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. It's just it was. It's going to be an obvious question. It was going to get asked in the comments. So, I just thought we'd uh, we'd throw that one at you while you've, we've got you live in front. But of it, us. it gives me a quandary of thinking: Do do does it uh, is it deserving of a badge now? Because I obviously didn't give it a badge last last time because I wasn't happy with the contrast performance. That's now been improved. Uh, it's still an incredibly expensive projector, but I do think overall it delivers a, a stellar performance in so many other areas. Um, and now that uh, clearly uh, JVC have listened to feedback, have improved the contrast performance to a degree, uh, you know, it might be that it sneaks in with a recommended badge 
with the proviso that you're going to need extremely deep pockets to even consider this as a projector. And, and of, course, um, of course, this machine is designed for a 200 inch screen as well. Yes, so and, and having aspect. it back in again, having it back in again when it was really hot. <laughs> <laughs> um, that thing pumps out a shitload of heat. So uh, you really, I mean, you really have to bear this in mind. This is a very large projector designed for large venues. It's a semi-professional slash professional model, really. Um, so you need to take that all that into account. It is pretty noisy still. Uh, it's still very noisy, in fact. Um, pumps out a shitload of heat. Um, you would need a hush box, some kind of cooling. Uh, it, it really is aimed at professional installations. It's not something you're just going to stick in your lounge. Let's put it that way. Not okay. Five thousand. Good. Okay, time to move on then. Away from projectors, let's go to Hodge, because Hodge's got a Yorkshire media player. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how to pronounce this. It's it, it's quite confusing. It's it's e greet or e gate or I don't know. There's a pitch, there's a bird on the box on the packaging which isn't an e oh, egret. No, but it's, it's not, not an e egret. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it looks nothing like that. It looks a bit like an eagle. So it's very confusing. I, don't, I think they've got the naming all over the shop. They're obviously from China and not from uh, <laughs> Huddersfield. Okay, the English is not their first language, is it? The four K media player, um, So it's yeah, it's an Android player. Uh, it's um, it's it's sitting itself alongside the likes of the PT Popcorn Iron Tune as in a dedicated player. Uh, it's priced accordingly at two hundred and fifty quid, um, but it does run on Android. But they, they, they try and steer you away from that with a stripped back UI. Uh, so it's it's basically just there for media functions. You get a nice. Uh, backlit remote control with it. Uh, it fits and accommodates a 3.5 uh, inch SATA hard drive up to 8 terabytes if you want to keep your storage local. Um, it's major selling point, if you could call it that, um, over the likes of the PT and, and others is it's got full um, menu support for um, Blu-ray uh, ISO files which means you can you just treat it like a, a blu-ray disc if, if that's what you like i mean i'm i'm the sort of person who just likes the movie just the movie ripped and, that, and that's a lot i don't i don't retain menus and all that nonsense but some people like it obviously um and it's it's got good build quality it's got a nice black aluminium casing um a really good connectivity uh you know all the up-to-date connectivity including hdmi 2.0a um and in terms of playback it, it um it's very, very, very good indeed. Uh, the only thing I've, I would hold against it is if you're a fan of 3D is um, in 3D ISO, it plays back at 24 frames per second exactly rather than 23.976. So you get a stutter every 41 seconds or so. Uh, and I, I did watch a full movie on it um, the other day, which had a weird stutter every sort of every 10 to every 10 to 15 minutes 15 minutes it just seemed to lose time and, and stutter you need to stop it and, and replay so um, there's a new firmware just which is really joyous just been released this morning so i'm going to load that on it and do a little bit more testing and and watch another movie on it tonight before issuing sort of a, a final recommendation or not on it um like i say it's very much against up against as a PT and in, in, in its capabilities and its build and its and, and its market. It's aiming. It's got Control Four integration, so you can. It's got an RS two three two port, um, so you can integrate it in a sort of the control system. Um, yeah, and it's, it's it's really really nice. I, like I say, I just I just need to watch and see if this firmware's improved the um, playback for Ultra HD Blu-ray. I'm oh, sorry, Blu-ray, not Ultra HD Blu-ray. Um, it's HDR compatible. Um, it's it's got a little Dolby Vision logo on the on the box, but apparently that's a mistake. Although the chipset is Dolby Vision capable, it's, they haven't got the software license from from Dolby as of yet. Apparently they they're they're asking for it, but I don't think they're going to get it. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a nice, it's a very accomplished little player. Um, I think uh, I think Roku have actually got the exclusive on that, haven't they? Dolby Vision yeah. playback. So. It'll be a while before they get that approval, I would have thought. Well, yeah, as a small Chinese company, they, they're always going to be struggling, aren't they? So, um, yeah, uh, I, I don't think, I wouldn't hold my breath on Dolby Vision support for this one. Um, but, yeah, it plays to HDR really well. Um, HDR 10, rather. And, yeah, it's it's a, it's a good player. I just, w- just want to make sure before issuing final, if, that this firmware, as promised, sort of clears up this stuttering issue. So, um, yeah, it's it's all right. Okay. So we'll, not great. We'll, we'll keep our eyes open for that review on the homepage anyway. Right, so rounding up on hardware, as uh, Ed rounding up, 
Is, is this in a positive way or a negative way? Are you rounding up on all-in-one systems? This is positive. Um, this has been a bit of an epiphany for me. Uh, I mean, obviously, my background is audio. My background was always, you know, when I was selling it and, and building it, that the best possible path to the highest possible audio performance was to consider um, separates. And after, uh, I suppose it's been a quite a long period now, but specifically over the last few months, as many of you will notice, I've been testing um, a large number of all-in-one systems. Now, not cheap all-in-ones. Many of them have been, uh, actually the bulk of them have been between two and a half and four thousand pounds. And I've reached the slightly sort of Damascene conclusion that I honestly think if you're spending that much money um, fresh out the fresh off the bat, that the all-in-one systems now do more and do do it better than the equivalent stack of separate equipment that you'd buy for the same money. Um, which I guess it's kind of a big deal, really, because it sort of, if you like, goes quite heavily against everything that I was actually sort of, um, um, sort of, you know, brought up or have been been working on over the last couple of now, years. <clears throat> now, Ed, is is that because generally we're we're moving towards high quality uh, file formats for our sources rather than separate sources? That's definitely part of it. Although. Uh, those of you with very, very long memories, one of the very first all-in-one systems I ever re um, reviewed was the name Unity Lite. And that was quite a long time ago, 2012, 2013. That still managed to start me thinking along these lines when it contained a CD mechanism. Um, it's no surprise to me, though, Phil, you're absolutely right. The moment that you can get rid of that noisy and fairly complex piece of machinery and simply rely on attaching it to a NAS drive or simply getting it onto a wireless network, that that makes life an awful lot simpler, that sort of generation of source equipment, and it you know allows you to shrink dimensions. But with specific reference to things like the Moon Neo Ace, the Lima Quasar, uh, the Convert Technologies Plato, which I've just done, which was different again, and that's completely self-contained. And then there's another one that's going to go through uh, soon from uh, Auralic. These are products where I sort of sit down and I start pouring through the... Um, uh, the you know, the, the alternatives that, to do the same functionality for the same price. And I sort of end up thinking, well, you'd end up with a much bigger stack of boxes. And I couldn't hand on heart tell you that they'd be better. And as I say, this is quite a big deal. I, I, it, it's it's something that sort of snuck up on me from, uh, you know, over the last couple of years. And to, it's not to say there's no argument for separates, because, of course, many people, well, the vast majority of people don't suddenly go, I'm going to spend £3,000 on an audio system, and they'll have been building up over time, and separates still obviously allow you to do that. But if you are in the, you know, against all odds, you're sat here listening to the podcast, you're thinking, I'd like to spend £2,000 plus on a stereo system, whereas two or three years ago, I said, well, you need to start looking at separate equipment. No, but I'm on, my gut feeling is now that you would be, better off looking at some of these all-in-ones because they are sensationally good. Interesting stuff. I think we need to have a new feature on Navy Forum's podcast called Ed's Epiphany. Yeah, well, I'd, as I say, it just runs counter to so many of the sort of things yeah, I've, for, I've believed over the years. F for a long time, and, and, and it held true back in an analogue world for a long time, it, it was always, you're going to get better performance out of separates because it's it's built that way and it's got better components in it and all the rest of it but now that we've moved to you know file based systems and NAS drives and all the rest of it and like you say it's 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 interesting to see where we're going with this because for a long time I was always down on digital formats and, and digital codecs and all the rest of it and um, you know thinking you know I want to have it I want to have it on a disc or some sort of physical f format because it's going to be better quality and actually, I catch myself now. I'm using Spotify, which is, you know, it's not high quality audio unless you're paying, <laughs> you're paying for like a title, which is. Um, but I find myself using, you know, services like that on fairly expensive equipment now. And you know, in all fairness, it, I think you're 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 on a losing battle if you're saying that physical media is is going to outlive 
the way we're going at the minute. We're definitely going digital formats. We're definitely going digital files. And that's that's going to bring more interest and product to market like you're seeing at the minute, Ed. Um, yeah, and, and it definitely. is interesting. No, it's it's. I think we're on. It's it's interesting because obviously, what's what's most fascinating is that so many of these systems are all self-contained, but they're actually fully equipped to then handle any vinyl fetish that you might have without actually getting in the way. I was wondering for, when vinyl for, was going to come into this. Well, <laughs> the thing is, you can buy these things and actually still then go and sink a fortune into a turntable. And I mean, if you go look at the Convert Technologies review, that had a re- ridiculously good photo stage in it completely unexpected but it this, the Auralic that i've got here was was fine um it's, it sounds perfectly reasonable they're perfectly capable of handling a bit of idiocy but if you aren't messing about with analog formats they're just self-contained brilliance app driven unconditionally stable and seriously seriously good um this wasn't quite how i envisaged the development of stereo hardware going in so many ways but nonetheless if if the quality of is what we're experiencing now is if that's what we've got to look forward to then i'm all for it yeah it's it's interesting to see where things are moving ed and um like i say i mean it, it's slowly happening to me and i'm not really realizing that i'm doing it and that's the way it's going to happen isn't it it's just we're, we're all going to transition over and and the mindset is going to change from what has traditionally been a hi-fi mindset of, of separate and it's it's going to come down to one box solutions in the future i can definitely see that happening absolutely I mean, don't get me wrong a number of manufacturers will continue to make good capital out of selling separate systems and there are certain things if you want to go down particular paths valves and stuff especially you're going to keep looking at separate boxes but the chances are your valve system will still then be driven by a fairly capable multi-function digital device that you know streams your formats um from your local network has streaming service access and so on and so forth so even there you're going to see this sort of this sort of pulling in of of, of functionality and, and reduction in box count and yeah uh, i have to say many people will be looking listening to that thinking i don't like the sound of that keep an open mind Go and listen if you know you're in the market for it. Go and listen to some of these one box solutions. I mean, the Moon in particular is just ridiculously good, and this Auralic is lovely, and it's got some very very clever features as well, which I've hopefully got across in the copy. <laughs> <laughs> after we've um after we finish this podcast, I then have to go and try and take photos of it um with a ruined back um which is <laughs> going to be fun. Um, so think of me. I I think it would be great if we could you know go and pick someone from the eighties and land them right now in front of one of these units and say, what do you think of this as your high five? <laughs> yeah. It would be, that would be something. But that said, I've long said, Phil, that if you sat me down in front of any current generation smartphone in 2000, I'd have shit myself. Yeah, so, very, very <laughs> true. I, I remember when it used to be the case, so it had to have a graphic equalizer, it had to have a dual cassette decks with, with high speed dubbing and Dolby noise reduction and the turntable on the top and oh you had to have your fm tuner absolutely had to it's have interesting though that actually user tweaking is coming back um because sat right next to me at the moment uh is one of the next month's review products we've got uh, a cord hugo 2 here and not only that we've got cord hugo 2 serial number 00001 which i think is pretty cool um and one of the things it has got built into it um, is adjustable filters, um, because unlike gra- graphic equalizers where you could make it sort of sound appreciably terrible or you could subjectively change it, there's no absolutely right answer for audio digital filtering, as you know. And rather than sort of sticking with one and you sort of living with that, manufacturers are now at least giving you the option to play about with a variety of different but all technically correct filter settings to sort of subjectively play about with what you're listening to, which I think is quite cool and quite clever. Yeah, good stuff. So that wraps up hardware for this week. Uh, So let's move on to movie news next. Okay, uh, moving on movie-wise, and uh, unfortunately I I haven't had a chance to see this film yet, but I will be getting out to the cinema to see it, because it's got cars in it, so anything with cars in, (laughs) um, unless it's Fast and Furious, because I can't be putting up with that shape, but other car films I'm well up for. So uh, Baby Driver, it's the the new one from one of my favourite directors, Steve. 
Yeah, Edgar Wright, who wrote and directed it. Uh, and although I think Baby Driver itself is the greatest title ever, I absolutely loved it. Kamara gave it 9 out of 10 in her review. I would give it the same. Uh, if you like music and cars, so I think you and Ed should absolutely love this film. It's funny. It's hip. It's original. It's got a fantastic cast. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I didn't fall asleep once, which is the first time I think in any film so far this month that I haven't done that. Um, it, yeah, it, it, I thoroughly enjoyed it from beginning to end. It's got some of the best car chases I've ever seen. Uh, but it's done. Everything's done to, to the music. So they, they've actually done shootouts and car chases. They've timed them to the music. So it's like watching a kind of vehicular musical getaway. Um, and uh, yeah, I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, and I highly recommend it to anyone. It is that kind of visual director, though, isn't he? I mean, you just have to look at stuff like Scott Pilgrim and and and, and the Cornetto Chillery, and some of the ways he composes his shots, but also the frenetic energy that he gets across. He's he's just really well suited to this type of thing, isn't he? Yeah, he is, uh, and it's. Uh, I mean, sometimes you could accuse him of being a little bit too hip and a bit too arch, but uh, but I think uh, I think the, the concept is is clever, and I think he he does it in a really imaginative way. I mean, every single shot's been thought out thoroughly, you know, and uh, even for the tracking shot, it's done to music and the guys dancing around the streets and that sort of stuff. It's brilliant, um, and like I say, the cast is also fantastic. All of them in their A game has got Kevin Spacey, Jamie Foxx, John Hamm. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's very funny. Uh, it's also got some really good action in it too. I mean, he, he it's, it's I think quite a rare trick to be able to do exciting action and also make it quite humorous and funny without you know without being one or the other. It's, it fits in between the two quite nicely. So it is funny in places. You will laugh out loud occasionally, but it's also got some genuine threat and some really good violence and action and, and as I say, some absolutely amazing car chases, all of which has been done for real, no CGI in sight at all. Um, and yeah, I, I absolutely loved it. And also, you can play spot the car because obviously it's got a lot of cars in it. And I think they may even pinch a red, um, a red uh, Mustang at one point. I couldn't quite see the front of it to tell whether well, it was definitely. A I'd, Mustang. Be, I'd be able to tell. <laughs> yeah, you would. You would. Um, but yeah, yeah. It's so uh, it comes highly recommended from both me and Kumari. And I'm glad to see that it's opening night. It opened uh, on Wednesday in this country. Also opened on Wednesday in the states. And it opened at number one in the States on Wednesday. So with the fingers crossed, it might actually do well at the box office, which would be good to see. Um, good to see something original and fun and entertaining, knocking things like Transformers off the top spot. It's just a shame he, none he, of those things. <laughs> it's just a <laughs> yes, shame that, uh, that he didn't get to do Ant-Man. It's a real shame because he, I was thinking he, that he, he really it. is a student of, of film. You just have to go back to Spaced, um, which is one of my all-time favourite TV series. And... The way he put that together, the way they, they all scripted it together, the way that it's just a study of pop culture and and filmmaking. And his films have been the same. Hot Fuzz is, is, is an absolute favourite of mine. I love Shaun of the Dead. Um, again, it's it's all playing on tropes that we know from movies. Uh, he, he plays all the tricks, but then he puts a twist on it, whether it's comedic or or it's done for effect or whatever. It, and, and it's just a shame because I think... I think that would have been a class film if he'd made that. I did enjoy the final version of Ant-Man, but I would love to have seen his version because he showed, I was thinking about this last night while I was watching Baby Driver, that he can do uh, action drama with a comic twist. It isn't an out-and-out -out comedy. And he could have done the same with Ant-Man. He could have done it, you know, it could have been an, you know, an action-packed um, comic book film with a little bit of comedy in there, but it didn't have to be an out-and-out -out comedy. And and it would have been interesting to see what he did, because you're right, I mean, this film's chock full of in-jokes and, and references and homages to famous car chase films and all sorts of stuff. It, it really is an absolute joy to watch. And if you're a film nut or a car nut or a music nut, because the soundtrack is amazing. It's, I, mean, I did recognise a few, quite a few of the songs in it, but there are also quite a few songs I didn't, I didn't know. Um, and it's a very eclectic mix of songs that re really has been chosen very specifically for the. They, it, tell, they actually tell the story through the music because the, the lyrics relate to what's yeah. happening on screen as well. It's very clever. The, the only other director that does that as well is. Um... Quentin Tarantino. Sorry, the only two directors <laughs> 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 that do that as well is obviously Quentin Tarantino, and I was going to say Danny Boyle as well. I mean, a Danny Boyle film, he will yeah. musically take you there. And and you'll think who is that? And you'll go and buy the soundtrack CD afterwards because he he'll put stuff in front of you that that you've probably never heard. It's same with Tarantino. He'll put stuff in front of you you've, you've never heard, but you just think I need to I need to hunt that down. What is that? And uh, you know Edgar Wright's always been like that as well. Really music music wise in terms of telling the story and and adding to to what's going on. Like I say, he's a student of film. Um, 
you know, these guys have, have, have grown up on 80s action and all the rest of it, which is what Hot Fuzz really was. It was a homage back to the, the yeah. Buddy Cop movies and Shaun of the Dead was obviously, you know, a homage to, to those fantastic zombie movies. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to going and seeing this now. So, um, uh, I hope you're right and I hope it doesn't disappoint Steve, otherwise we'll be having words when I get back. <laughs> uh, films opening this week, there's a big comic book film opening, which I'm probably not going to bother to see. Uh, yep, there's one big release this week, uh, and it, I, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's very anticipated because it's Spider-Man Homecoming, and obviously Spider-Man popped up in Captain America Civil War because Marvel and Sony have done a deal, and this is the first standalone Spider-Man film. It's a Sony Pictures, but it's part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, so you've got Tony Stark in the film, you've got Stark Tower, you've got mentions of the Avengers, but it's... Um, I'm really looking forward to it because it's basically they haven't they're not going to bother with origin stuff again because they've already done that twice. Um, you know, they've introduced him in Captain, Captain America Civil War. Now we've got a young Peter Parker still at high school, played by a young kid, which is good. Uh, I thought Tom was fantastic in the part in, in Civil War. So I'm looking forward to seeing him playing in, in the full film. Um, but you've got him back at high school. You've got him in New York. And you got him sort of dealing with a villain of the, the vulture played by uh, Michael Keaton. And I think, you know. Marvel haven't put a foot wrong as far as I'm concerned so far in their movies. And I think them coming on board to help Sony make this movie is a good call. I think Sony's done the right thing. I think that they've done the clever thing. I think Fox should do the same thing with the Fantastic Four if they've got any sense. But Sony's done the clever thing. They're going to have a massive hit on their hands now. Uh, and we're going to get a, a fun movie with the real spirit of Spider-Man in there. Um, because he's my favourite comic book character. He's the one I used to read when I was a kid. So I'm looking forward to seeing a, you know, a, a, a cocky, quipping, uh, young high school student um, Spider-Man. Can you look at the other films? Like Tobey Maguire, he was about 38 when he was making Spider-Man. Well, I was, I was just going to say, <laughs> high school student that's not in his 30s. Yeah, quite. Even Andrew Garfield was knocking on the door in you know, late 20s. Um, whereas Tom Holland is, I think, late teens. So he was maybe very, at most 20, 21. So he's pretty young. Um, and he, I think he's very good. Um, he's a young English actor. I think he's got real talent. Um, and yeah, looking at the trailers, I, it makes me want to see it. I know you guys have com- commented on the trailer saying you didn't find it that interesting, but I can't wait to see it. I think it's going to be a great movie. Uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Stunning. I won't be going anywhere near it, of course. It's in the cinema and it's full of people. But I think my <laughs> you wife. Should, you should break your cinema ban and go and see Baby Driver because I think you'd love that, Ed. I'll just wait for it to come out on Jobby. <laughs> it's fine. I think we should all club together and get him an unlimited card. <laughs> I'll tell you what, mine's had an absolute spanking this month. In June, I saw five films. I worked out it was like over 70 quid's worth of. Uh, tickets that I, I spent yeah, well, 20 you, you're obviously not working hard enough if you've got all this spare time to watch all these TV series that you seem to be watching uh, all yeah. these Blu-rays that you seem to be watching and going to the cinema we're obviously you're obviously not doing enough work I, I thought that was my job <laughs> no I take it on board it does look actually quite entertaining um, uh, it, there's an outside infinitesimal chance I might go somewhere near a cinema but don't don't build your hopes up you know, <laughs> the really the really good it. news is because it's a sony pictures release rather than a walt disney slash marvel release it will actually get an ultra hd blu-ray <laughs> release so uh finally we'll get a marvel movie on ultra hd blu-ray officially whether it's a half decent movie or not we, we, we've just well, has to... that ever has it ever stopped me in the past <laughs> no never right blu-ray right. releases this week uh what's out yeah two major releases this week we've got uh, a cure for wellness which um, is directed by Gore Verbinski, who made the Pirates of the Caribbean films and also things like R- Rango. Very weird-looking film um, set in a, in, a, in, a, in a clinic in Switzerland where they have a, an unusual cure. Um, it, it's very out there. Um, I'm not sure it's my cup of tea. I, I certainly think it looks visually impressive. Uh, so the stuff I've seen in the trailers and clips, it looks like you know it, it, it's very visually impressive, but I'm not sure whether I necessarily enjoy it. Uh, but that's out this week if, if you're into that kind of thing. And also uh, this week we have Hidden Figures, which is out on Blu-ray and on Ultra HD Blu-ray, which I have seen and I thoroughly enjoyed. It's actually a true story about the uh, the space program in the US when NASA were first setting it up before they had more sophisticated computers. They had to actually use people to do a lot of the calculations. They were called computers. They called them computers, but they were, they were people doing the calculations. And it turned out they had a, a large group of black women who were particularly adept at, the make, at doing these complex calculations quickly. Uh, and they had a whole group of, calcul- of what they call computers. And um, so the film's really about the space program and also being a woman in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, and also being black in the late 50s, early 60s. So there was segregation even in NASA at the time, even though there wasn't supposed to be because it was a government uh, institution. Um, and uh, it's a really interesting film. I, I found it 
great performances uh, headed up by Kevin Costner, but great performances from the ladies involved and an interesting story, uh, quite moving. And, and it addressed, you know, various issues, not just the space program, but also race in, in, in late 50s, early 60s America. And uh, yeah, I thought it was a fantastic film, really enjoyed it. So a recommendation for me, if you to give you into the space program, which I am. Any Ultra HD Blu-ray news? Yeah. Um, out next week on Ultra HD Blu-ray, obviously they're already available on Blu-ray, but out on Ultra HD Blu-ray are the Planet of the Apes films. So Dawn, Rise of the Planet of the Apes and Dawn of the Planet of the Apes are coming out. Um, obviously it's time with the release of War of the Planet of the Apes, which comes out uh, in a couple of weeks' time. So uh, they're out on Ultra HD Blu-ray. Um, and, uh, you know, from what I've, I haven't seen them yet myself, although I do have them, but uh, from what I've heard, they are uh, quite good transfers they do add a bit more detail and hdr is quite well quite well used um and so if you don't own the films get them i don't know whether they're, they're worth updating but you've already got them well i'm gonna have to buy because they're, they're one of the most used you have to buy demo, one, demo <laughs> sequences and one that i use all the time so I, i'll need to have the 4k hdr version of that just to um, add that into the testing regime right so uh to wrap uh, up hang on, hang on i'm not finished i haven't actually got to the big big ultra hd blu-ray news <sighs> oh, right okay <laughs> Uh, yeah, the big news, Ultra, Ultra HD Blu-ray wise, is the announcement of the, uh, Blade Runner on the fifth of September. Oh, so that's not coming another out. Another Blade Runner, Jesus! That's, how many yeah, times Blade, have I? Yeah, but it was restored at 4K, so we're going to get 4K HDR Dolby Atmos soundtrack. So you're going to get everything. I thought I had everything with the five disc or six disc blinking set that I had to pay a hell of a lot of money for twice because I bought it on HD DVD and then I had to buy it again on Blu-ray. Yeah, so did I. <laughs> and I'd also bought it on DVD before that. Jesus, how many times? I, um, I, it, be, it better be a fourteen ninety nine release. <laughs> uh, yeah, I doubt it will be. But uh, anyway, I'm excited to see Blade Runner in four K. After they, I know they did a very very detailed restoration on this for the original camera negative. They even restored. They they, they scanned it at four K. They scanned um, the effect shots, which were shot on sixty five mil at eight K. So um, I'm hoping we're going to get an incredibly an incredible looking disc out of this. One one of the most incredible shots committed to film is is that opening when he's being flown to the police headquarters yeah um that that sequence there with van gallis playing is just it's just one of them wow things it, it always takes my breath away when i see it and also yeah. that more soundtrack it's a stirring too. vision of the past sorry no <laughs> <laughs> you're right ed it is well obviously it's, it's coming out on disc to time with the release of blade runner 2049 which comes out uh in i think september october so that's out soon. I can entirely contain myself for that one. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, know, I wasn't. I'm curious because Denis Villeneuve's directing it, and he's done some really interesting films. So, we'll see. right. So let's uh, wrap up this week's podcast because we're way over time, as we always are every week. Uh, Christmas in July. Uh, so we've had our summer. Our summer was two weeks ago now. Um, we're now uh, in the depths of. It looks like winter outside my window at the moment. Um, I can I can't even see the trees the other side of the street because of the fog at the minute, and the drizzle. Um, it's like a, a nice December day. So why why don't we have Christmas in July now that summer has ended? We're back to normal. Um, what are our favourite cold wintry films? And um, I'm going to kick off with this one because I want to get it out of the way. Um, the the most cold I've ever felt watching a film recently is The Revenant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If any movie is going to f- make you go and put the fire on, even in the height of summer, it is that film. It is so bleak. It is so cold uh, looking on on the screen. Uh, other wintry films, I, I'm I, I guess Fargo. Yeah, yeah, Fargo. Um, if you like lots of snow, then then you got Fargo. Uh, Gremlins. Yes, the snow in Gremlins. Now here's a question. I'm just thinking. That, I'm thinking the films are snowing them. <laughs> You've seen both, so what are you saying? That the Revenant makes you feel colder than Everest. Uh, ah, you, yes, it does. It does. I, I think it's just so bleak, and so because uh, yeah, because yeah. Everest is a laugh a minute. <laughs> I, 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 know, I know, but 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 the thing that well, what the point I'm trying to make there is that I I have more in common with. The landscapes that are featured in Revenant, because I've been there and I can, I, I have first-hand experience of that. I have never cl- climbed Everest, and I'm not a mountain climber, like so, I so I have, with all that walking you're doing, I, I reckon there's no time like the present. I, I have. No, he's scared of heights, though, Ed, isn't he? Yeah. I'll oh, sponsor yeah. you 50p a mile. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, what I'm saying is, 
personally, I, I, I relate more to the Revenant in terms of I, I can appreciate that landscape. I've been there. I've, I've been in landscapes like that and experienced cold like that. I've never been up a mountain. I couldn't tell you. Fair enough. Um, well, w- my wife and I have a specific one. When the weather reaches a certain level of grimness, normally on a weekend afternoon, we will normally sit down and watch the day after tomorrow. It's just ideal <laughs> for that sort of thing. Uh, it's not by any stretch of the imagination a great film. In fact, it's a pretty terrible one. But it is absolutely ideal for when the I, weather is. I'm simple. starting to see a pattern here. Independence Day, the day after tomorrow. I'm not watching Independence Day. It was you that brought that up. I know you said it was one of your favourite films. I quite enjoy it from time to time. I don't, I, one of my favourite films. I don't know if I've ever gone that far. It's um, it's perfectly good. But day after tomorrow, when the weather is terrible for whatever reason, it just works. Don't argue. It just does. So there. Can't be bothered to argue. Mr. Botry. Um, does it count as wintry if it's the thing? I can't remember exactly yeah, where it's set. Well, it's set in the Arctic Circle, but yeah, we'll give you that one. It's got snow in it. Because it's that kind of... I, I love watching that one when the weather draws in and when it's dark outside, and particularly if it's kind of howling and sleeting and that kind of thing. It, it's the kind of perfect winter film because everyone's kind of shut inside and they're almost kind of pushed in by the weather so it's not just a cold environment it's it's kind of you know that claustrophobic feel of winter that i I think kind of chimes well yeah i mean the only thing missing is the heinz tomato soup in the hand in a cup perfect winter's winter's cure there i don't know it's all a bit tomato heinz tomato soup my son is attempting to live on it at the moment so i think there's a degree of over familiarity but it's, it's just not heinz's finest hour yeah sorry i make my own soup so i'm better than all of you well, I also well, I make, make my own soup as well, but just oh, uh, okay. something about winter, though. It's something about winter and a nice hot Heinz tomato soup. Steve, no, Steve, you're you're from a posh background. You don't you don't do Heinz. I love a bit of Heinz tomato soup. Lovely. Um, right, uh, I'll go for the grey. That that's that's grim and cold and horrible, and uh, that'd be my choice of for wintery. Do, do you know that that's still sitting in my to watch pile and I bought it on, on and I bought it the week five it, years ago <laughs> I bought it the week it was released Steve and it's still sitting towards the bottom of that pile it's to, in it's fact it'll, to... it'll still be in its cellophane wrapper mm-hmm. if um, you're talking just winter weather and rain what about something like seven because that feels like practically every every scene other than the ending is raining it is yeah yeah well we've it's already men- city though aren't they we've, on the edge we've of already, desert, um, the pisses with rain we've already mentioned Blade Runner as well if you want dank and wet well, there you go. We really are enthusing over this one, aren't we? Dank and wet. <laughs> Dank and wet. Dreek. Dreek it. Empire Strikes Back, Battle of Hoth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who hasn't the stepped of- inside a tauntaun <laughs> <laughs> on a cold winter's day? <laughs> and on that bombshell, that's it for the, this week's AV Forums podcast. My thanks to Steve Weathers. He stinks. I don't like him. Mark Hodgkinson. He's not here. Ed Selly. We've got a page six problem. And Mark Potwright. Crap, crap, mega crap. Don't forget, you can follow us on... <laughs> that just sums everything up, Mark. Uh, I mean, it got, it got to the point where Hodges just buggered off. Anyway, uh, don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Bookmark AB Forums for latest reviews, news and video. And of course, uh, why not leave us those five-star ratings on iTunes only if you enjoyed the show. Don't forget, go and subscribe to our uh, AB Forums YouTube channel if you haven't already done that. Let's get over the 50,000 subscribers. And uh, Mark's off to D- it was DFS. He was off to, wasn't it, for the sale? Emergency sale, something like that. Well, we all there's a, comes a time in a man's life when we all need to s- impulse buy a sofa because that DFS sale <laughs> that's only on for a short period of time. Yeah, yeah. Well, stocks last. <laughs> anyway, I'm feeling. Thanks very much for listening, and we'll see you again next week. Sure.